Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 11. We are this morning finishing the third part of this series, Christianity 101, going back to grow forward. And I think it's a very important topic that we're ending with this morning. If you have attended Cedarview for a while now, you know that we are a church with a big heart for missions, whether local or abroad. We have a group that goes down to Regent Park once a month to help feed the needy. We usually send out two to three short-term missions teams a year. We have World Impact Sundays in the spring and in the fall. Two of our families have uh, gone or are going out to minister in other countries. The Shalinars in Italy, Amara and Natty are leaving next month for Guyana. Could we do more? Sure, we could but only if people are willing to step up and start serving and leading. So sending people to minister the gospel is at the heart of this church, and it was in the early church as well. And so let's look at our passage, Acts eleven nineteen to 30. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius, who was Caesar. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. I love reading about this church in Antioch as I read through the book of Acts. It is one of the standout churches of the last 2,000 years. And if you study the church in Antioch in your Bible, you'll find that it's a model church that we should emulate in many different ways. See, Antioch was in Syria in those days, in the first century. And today, if you were to go to the same place, it's called Antakya and is in the eastern part of Turkey. During the first century, Antioch was a great cultural center, but it was a city of gross immorality. It was a city that literally worshipped sex. It was a pagan city full of all kinds of immoral behavior, and it was all bound up in their religion. Just five miles outside of Antioch, there was a famous temple called the Temple of Daphne. And this was a temple that was filled with ritual prostitutes. And if you can imagine, this was church for them. This was the center of their religious life. And yet this is a city, yet this city, in this city, this dark, immoral place, it was the city that where God raised up a mighty church. He said, this is where I'm doing it. See, the church never needs to be afraid of the darkness because and we could probably all say this, greater is he that is in you than he's that in the world. If God is for us, who can stand against us? And this is where God raised up the great Antioch church. And it became a hub, in fact, for all the missionary enterprises across the world in those days. If you read through the book of Acts carefully, you'll see that the first 10 chapters is all about Christianity in Jerusalem which was the center of the Christian world. It's all about the gospel to the Jews and their Samaritan cousins. 
And the key person in the first 10 chapters is the Apostle Peter, who's reaching out to the Jewish people. But the book is divided in two. Because then the church was scattered from Jerusalem, as we just read, by persecution and thrust out to become a powerful missionary movement. The movement Jesus intended when he gave the church that first commission. And so from chapter 11 onwards, the center of the Christian world shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch. And the key person for the second half of the book of Acts is, of course, the Apostle Paul. As he reaches out to the Gentile world. See, a shift like that has taken place a number of times in church history. It shifted in the first century from Jerusalem to Antioch. In the fourth century, under the emperor Constantine, the center of the church moved to Rome. Then there was division between east and west, between Rome and Constantinople, and you had two centers of Christianity. Centuries later, in the 16th century, you had the Reformation, and the center shifted again briefly to Germany, where Martin Luther was, and then to Geneva in Switzerland, where John Calvin was. But it didn't stay there. It was on the move again, and the action shifted to Great Britain as missionaries were sent from England all over the globe. In the 20th century, North America became the hub of missionary outreach. But here's the interesting thing. In the last 30 years, we would have to say that the center of Christianity has shifted again. The centers of the great missionary drives today is shared between spots like Nairobi, Kenya, Latin America, and China. China is sending out missionaries every day, even from an underground church. And so God is continuing to advance his mission gloriously. And don't believe those naysayers that say, oh, Christianity is in trouble. Christianity is shrinking. We may have some great challenges here in North America about the church, and we need to see the church revived. But I tell you that around the globe, God is harvesting his church for eternity. Jesus is building his church, and he said the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and it cannot. Because God is moving today. And so this morning, I want to go right back to the beginnings and look at this amazing church in Antioch. And the first thing we see here is a surprise beginning. It's astonishing how the gospel came to Antioch and how that church got founded. And what we see is the intersection of three great forces at that moment to bring that church into existence. The first force was that it was a product of persecution. That church would not have existed if it weren't for the fact that the Christians in Jerusalem came under intense persecution. You can see that in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. The church went out from Jerusalem. It went to these new places and began seeking out the Jews in those cities and telling them the gospel of the Messiah, that Jesus had come. The church had always thrived, had its greatest seasons of growth and expansion, and even done its best missionary work during times of persecution. And that is absolutely true today as well. Do you know where the fastest growing church is right now in the world? It's in Iran, where there's tremendous persecution against Christians. Iran is exploding with the gospel, closely followed by China. Again, persecuted Christians underground, but the gospel is expanding. And that's what happened in the first century. See, for a while, Christianity was still very much a Jewish venture. They somehow seem to keep their blinders on to the, to the rest of the world. Which really isn't surprising when you look at their upbringing in that Jewish culture that was so prejudiced against the Gentile world. But God stepped in and he allowed that persecution in Jerusalem to heat up to a boiling point until the Christians fled for safety. 
and they scattered across the world. See, that's how the gospel began to spread. And that was the first great force that was at work, the force of persecution. God is very concerned about the church evangelizing the world, and he will do whatever it takes to mobilize us. He will do whatever it takes to get his church to move out in evangelism across the world. Secondly, you have the power of the pew. Even scattered abroad, the first thing that the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem did was they looked to evangelize other Jewish people. Then you read verse 20, it begins with the word, but. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Who were the Hellenists? Well, these were Greek-speaking people in the city of Antioch. And so this group of Christians arrive in the pagan city of Antioch, and prompted by the Holy Spirit, they did something incredible and unimaginable to most Jews at that time. They preached the gospel to Greek people living there in Syrian Antioch. And lo and behold, they responded and they got saved. Look at Acts 21, 11, 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord was with them. How did they know the hand of the Lord was with them, though? Because people were getting saved. This is something that the early, under, early church understood very well, and something that we sometimes lose sight of. Salvation is always c- completely a miraculous work of God. Every Christian is a miracle. You are a miracle. Because it's a miracle when somebody comes and gives their life to the Lord. People are not born again unless the Holy Spirit draws them and convicts them and regenerates them with spiritual life and grants them the gifts of repentance and faith. Only God can do that in people's lives. And when they got the news back in Jerusalem about souls being saved in Antioch, those Jewish leaders thought, what what in the world is going on down there? They had a hint of what was coming when the Lord sent Peter down to preach to that Roman Cornelius and his household, but they had not yet shifted their attention to the Gentile world. Now, God had just thrust them out. He did it himself. He sent them out to all these different places. He didn't need counsel. He didn't need a missions board. He didn't need committee meetings. God allowed a little persecution And then he got a hold of a group of people running for their lives to Antioch. And Antioch would become that perfect mission sending people for the whole known world. See, God knew what he was doing. And God knows what he's doing in your life. See, this story shows us that God is so committed to his plan of saving his church out of every tribe and nation. Reaching out to these Gentiles in Antioch was the first step of getting the gospel to all of Asia, Africa, and Europe. God himself went after our ancestors. Most of us in this room are Gentiles, right? We have the gospel today because of God's determination, and it began in earnest in Antioch. Now, look at who God used. Where were the great apostles? They were back in Jerusalem. All the ordained preachers, all the officials, where were they? Jerusalem. But God took up this little group of people, and we don't even know their names. We just know that they were Jewish Christians from Cyprus and Cyrene. And we know that they were on fire and full of the Holy Spirit. And God led them to preach to the Greeks of the city, and the outcome was amazing. Now, I said there were three forces that were converging to produce this beginning in Antioch. Product of persecution, power of the pew. Thirdly, it was the purpose of God. It was God's moment. He was not taking no for an answer. He was not willing to wait on the church to figure out that they needed to move out of Jerusalem. He was ready and the time was right. God's will is going to be done. He is in control, and God is using his church, but he will do whatever it takes. 
And if we miss the day of his visitation, if we aren't involved, we will be the ones who miss out because God's going to get it done, whether we like it or not. And so the first thing we see in this story is a surprise beginning. Out of nowhere, it seemed, but out of the missionary heart of God, this Gentile church was born in Antioch. So here's a simple principle that we need to be absolutely certain of in our hearts. It's this. God has a plan for every church. God had the whole future of that little congregation exploding and sending missionaries around the world. He had a plan for that church in Antioch, and he has a plan for Cedarview Community Church. And he's got a plan for you, and he's got a plan for me, and for all of us together. Secondly, we see a strong grounding. This church in Antioch had an astonishing start, but then God gave them something that is vitally important for every church. Look at verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So back in Jerusalem, they hear the startling story about some non-Jews living in Antioch that had come to faith in Christ. Could it be God? Is God doing this? If it's a genuine conversion, it had to be God because only he can do that. And there was that vision that Peter had had and the Cornelius incident. And they did remember that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So all the tumblers started to fall into place for them at last. And they said, we better get somebody up to Antioch, someone we trust with discernment and wisdom, who's full of the Holy Spirit, that hears from God and is a man of faith. And so they sent Barnabas. And if you remember from last week, He's also an an encourager. So Barnabas headed up to Antioch, and what he found there, it says, delighted him. It was a real work of God. He knew these people had gotten saved, and a church was forming. He could see it. And he encouraged them, and he preached, and it says that more people started to, to get saved. And it began to grow, and then Barnabas thought to himself, this is big. I need help. And led by God, he took a quick trip to a place called Tarsus and found a guy that he knew he needed. It was that old enemy of the church, that persecutor of the saints, and his name was Saul of Tarsus, though now we know him as Paul. And at the time, he was only starting to be known. He was still in obscurity, and many Christians didn't trust him because of his past, even though the call of God was on his life. Specifically, the call was on him to go to the Gentiles. So the stage was set for Antioch. Paul came back with Barnabas to the city, and for the next year, they taught the word of God side by side. They instructed the church. They set solid foundations in it. And that church was going to need very strong foundations, because this was going to be, as I said earlier, the launching pad for the rest of the known world. So it had to be strong. It had to be a strong church. It says at the end of verse 26 that they taught a great many people. They had a crowd, and it was getting stronger every day. And one of the characteristics, characteristic marks of the early church, and particularly this church in Antioch, is that they were a soul-winning church an evangelistic church. I don't mean just the pastors, but every believer was out there doing that. And that's the church of Jesus Christ. When these first believers in Antioch preached the gospel in that idolatrous, promiscuous city, God blessed their witness. 
Those in Antioch turned from their idols to the true and living God, and they renounced their idolatry. And one by one, people began to come out of paganism to follow, Christ, to follow Christ. And how many of you believe that no matter how dark or secular or immoral a society may become, the gospel of Jesus, when it is preached, is greater than the darkness? Paul says to, in the book of Romans that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And so whenever you share the gospel with someone, you've got to believe the power of God is being let loose in their life. Anybody telling the word of God has got to believe that they are releasing all of God's power into that person's life because the word of God does not come back void. You are the instrument God is using at that moment to speak life into that person. Now, there's something at the end of verse 26 that I don't want you to overlook or miss because we take it often for granted. Verse 11, uh, verse 26, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Up until this point, they were usually called by the name the way. It was the way of Christ. It was the way of Jesus the Nazarene. And so they were called the way. And if you're a Star Wars fan, do not get this you know, confused with the Mandalorian and this is the way, because that's not the case. This is the way. This is the only way there was. And so they were called Christians. And it literally means Christ's ones. And by the reading of the text here, they didn't give themselves that name. They weren't sitting there trying to come up with a catchy name or contacting a marketing agency. Christian wasn't a denominational tag. It's what the city called them. It's what the people called them. They are Christ's ones. And do you know what this tells me? They didn't go around telling people about their church. They didn't go around telling people about their preachers. You should come and hear this guy, Paul and his friend Barnabas. They're awesome. you got to hear them. No, not at all. What did they talk about? They talked about Jesus. They preached about him who had come and died on a cross for the sins of the whole world, that he had been buried, but he was risen again, and he changed their lives. It was all about Jesus. So they became Christ's ones. They talked about him so much that unbelieving people called them Christ ones. Quite possibly in the beginning, it was a term of contempt. But you know what? The believers wore it as a badge of honor. And to this very day, that's our title. How many of you are thrilled to tell people, I'm a Christian. I belong to Jesus. He's my savior. He's my king. I'm a Christian today. Or do you kind of go like this? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah. You're a what? I'm a Christian. What are you? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Or do you believe in its power? Don't ever be ashamed of his name. Even if some parts of society say, oh, they're dangerous slot over there. We want to be dangerous to the devil. We want to be dangerous to hatefulness. We want to be dangerous to the sin in the world, but we don't want to be dangerous to people as we bring them the love of Christ. We want to show them all that God has for them. We are Christians. We follow Jesus. So we have a surprise beginning, all that God did to start that church. And then there was a strong grounding. In the providence of God, Paul and Barnabas were sent to establish the work, and it quickly became a strong, soul-winning church. Please hear me. No church can be healthy and dynamic without strong discipleship. Without people being trained in God's word, being built up in their faith through God's word. Without the scriptures getting a hold of their life through good, solid teaching so that they can live out the faith that's been given to us by the apostles. Think of another church in the New Testament, the church down in Corinth. That church was 
full of charismatic gifts. They were filled with excitement, but they were a weak and troubled church. Antioch was well taught, strongly discipled, and they were a powerful church. And so let me ask you this question for you to think about this week. What is your plan for discipled growth as a disciple over the next year? For you to grow as a believer? For you to step up to the next stage of your Christian faith? We can provide every option for you to get that teaching. We can teach the Bible every Sunday morning and night. We have Christian ed classes. We have Wednesday connection groups. We have other groups that meet as well. All these things are just discussing God's word and getting into it. We can provide all of these things, but if you don't make the decision, I'm going to grow as a Christian, it won't happen. If you are content to just come every Sunday morning, sit in that seat, go home and say, well, my duty's done for this week, nothing's going to happen and you're not going to grow at all in your relationship with God. See, we need a church full of people being discipled. Number three, a spiritual flourishing. A surprise beginning, but a strong grounding, and then out of this strength came a spiritual flourishing. This church did not see supernatural things. Sorry, this church did see supernatural things. The Holy Spirit was moving in this church. It was not dry and stagnant. It was full of the Holy Spirit. They opened their hearts and their lives to God's working and God's power. And it says here in these verses that we've been reading that that there were prophets in that church. I'm talking about real prophets, not like the granola prophets that we have today, flakes and fruits and nuts, okay? These guys were the real deal. One of them by the name of Agabus heard from God, and he actually accurately prophesied a famine that was going to happen, that was going to come into Judea. And it happened exactly as God told them. And that's ultimately a proof of a prophet. That what they say comes to pass. And in the Old Testament, it says if it doesn't come to pass, take them outside the city gates and stone them. Because they're worthless. And think about how many people today would not be saying some of the things they did if we still followed that rule. All right? But this man, Agabus, was full of the Holy Spirit. And prophetically, he spoke about a famine that was going to come down there in Jerusalem into Judea, and it passed. It came to pass. He didn't prophesy that to get a big name, go on tour, sell a book, or in his case, a scroll. God told the church that information for a specific reason, because God loves his people, and a very hard time was about to come to the Christians in Judea. And they were going to suffer. So what did they do in Antioch when they heard this word from God? They responded to the need even before it happened. It says they raised money and they sent relief down to their Christian brothers in Judea for when the famine came. They looked after another part of the church. You have a small, new, Gentile church that looked after its bigger, established Jewish brother. And don't you think that did a lot for unity of the early church? Don't you think that helped to bury some of the old prejudices? The church in Antioch was full of power of the Holy Spirit, not for prestige or for glory, but for fruitfulness. And the first fruit was harvest. Souls being saved will always be the greatest miracle the church will ever see. More important than anything else is is that people be saved And that was happening in Antioch. Second, they also were doing compassion ministry there. Their love was overflowing to help others. God loves on churches that love what he loves. And this church in Antioch began to go from strength to strength to strength because they were obedient to to keep doing God's priorities. And so he kept on blessing them. It's not about doing things and asking God, God, will you bless what I'm doing here? How about you look at what God is doing and start doing that? Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, prayed this prayer years ago. He prayed, 
Lord, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. What's on God's heart? Let's do that and he will keep blessing. God loves on churches who love what he loves. If you flip in your Bible over to Acts 13, and I'm closing with this, you will see the continuing story of the church in Antioch. Acts 13, 1 to 4. Now there were, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Man- Mananean, a lifelong fl- friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Here in this passage, we see the final step in progression, and that is a selfless sending. They had an amazing beginning. They were grounded well, brought up with amazing teaching, and they began to flourish in the Holy Spirit. But then they began a selfless sending. This is the moment that the gospel exploded forth from Palestine and Syria to the rest of the known world. As a church, church was worshiping, fasting, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the gathered believers were led to do something. Send Paul and Barnabas on mission. Why would they do that? Barnabas and Saul, these are the guys who've been pouring in and making that work so solid. It's under their ministry that the Holy Spirit had been flourishing. Why would they do this? They loved Saul and Barnabas. They loved their teaching. They loved everything that was going on. Yes. But listen, missional churches send their best on mission. Missional churches send their best their best people, their best resources, their best praying. It's not just about meeting about our needs. It's about the needs of those who are reaching out with the gospel from us. Remember, God sent us his best. The greatest missionary in the world was God's best. He sent his one and only son to save us. So here's this principle. If a church isn't sending, it's ending. This goes hand in hand with God, with God's love on churches. Sorry, God loves on churches what loves what he loves. If we're not sending, it won't take long for God to say, if you're not going to do it, I'll bless someone else. And churches go through cycles. They grow, go through cycles of birth and growth and life and death. Unless mission is missions is kept at the core. Then the cycle can go back to new life and continuing in the blessing of God. But if a church isn't sending, it's ending. And I'm so thankful that we are a church that is a sending church and a church that believes in missions. This This church in Antioch became the kind of a mission control as the gospel went out to the ends of the earth. They were the lifeline for missionaries that went out all across the Mediterranean. In World War II, they figured out that they needed, that for every one man on the front lines of battle, they needed approximately 20 personnel behind that man supporting him with all kinds of logistical support. People who were just behind the lines supporting him, but then all the people at home who were making the ammunition and sending it there who were keeping the economy going, who was sending the food and the supplies. And so behind every man, they needed 20 people to have him there. And we are in a war, church. We are in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and women. Nothing is more important in the universe right now than this war effort, and God has declared it. For every global worker that is out on the field, You need people who are sending them, praying for them, 
loving on them, believing with our whole heart that that mission will be successful as we send them. Every church needs to be sending our best. As our young people get discipled and growing in the things of God, some of them will say, you know, God's call, God will call them. And some of the, our youth, some of our young adults are going to say, I want to go to another place. I feel God is calling me to go to this place. And we're not to say, oh, hang on, we need you here. We need you here to keep our church vibrant. No. God's got other people to come in that he can bring in. If someone gets the call of God in their life, we need to send our best to the ends of the earth. We know, we know this is a church with a missional heart. We see that at World Impact when we send our money to support so many projects that otherwise might not happen. We see that when the teams get ready to go and people are praying for them, people supporting them with different fundraising events and all that. The short-term teams are short-term. Let's continue to send our bodies. Let's continue to send our kids. Let's all consider that maybe just your retirement needs to be spent with some other group rather than just sitting at home. We have seen families go from here. I mentioned Dan and Jennifer Chalinar who will be here next Sunday morning. Amar and Natty Ram who are leaving soon. And I know that God is working on others here as well about going out into the mission field. But maybe God's call is for you to stay here. Your mission field is here. And I pray that this place gets filled up with people who believe that their mission field is the area around them. Their street, their subdivision, their school, their work, their city. And so whether it's staying or going, we each have a place to, uh, a part to play in the sending and being a part of it. So whether you're the one or the 20, you are involved. But remember this, if you're, involved, if you're the 20 helping the one that's somewhere else, you are the one that is in your neighborhood and 20 people are helping you as you reach out to your subdivision, to your neighbors, to your school. Let's pray.